And we talked about mentors, and I am very pleased to bring up to the stage now Dr. Francine Hardaway, who is one of my mentors, and, um, and her panel. So come on up. Francine, Chris, Lena, come on back, and Taylor. I'll sit on the end. I haven't been out of the house in three years because of COVID, so I'm a little rusty on this public stuff. But this is, I did this for Joan because this is the most important panel of the whole thing, is the voice of the patient. This morning is the important morning. And I was listening to these stories that were coming out this morning and I was feeling, first of all, enormous gratitude because I'm 81 and I don't have cancer yet. I mean, I, I fully expect that I will have it, but I don't have it yet. So that's, that was my first feeling was enormous gratitude. And then my love and empathy and sympathy from, for all of you for when you got your diagnoses and how you must have felt. And you, you've all given such positive stories about the treatment that you've gotten. Um, but there are a lot of negative stories also. And OK, I'll share my story first. Joan gave me this sheet of paper, and I have to follow it. I'm not a person who follows <laughs> instructions, but uh, I'll tell you my story. Uh, my story is that I decided a long time ago that I was trying, that I was going to get on board the anti-aging movement. And so about 12 or 13 years ago, I became vegan. And I still am vegan, although I've started to add some sardines because you're supposed to need more protein and more omega-3s as you get older. And once I became vegan, I got into the nutrition conversation and the nutrition wars about whether it should be vegan or it should be keto or it should be whatever. But, you know, my feeling is it... And the big thing that you take away from all of that is it shouldn't be the regular American diet and it shouldn't be processed food. And the other thing that I took away from it was um, some really um, interesting views on exercise. I had always been a runner and I thought I was just running because of heart disease. I mean, to prevent heart disease. But I realize now that running was the luckiest thing I ever did in my whole life because now it turns out that exercise is the other big kahuna of keeping you alive longer. And then the other thing that I was blessed with was I love to sleep and I loved my bed. So I've always gotten eight hours of sleep. Joan knows this. In fact, everybody knows it. I leave everything to, so that I can get to bed by 9 o'clock. And they're all like, you're crazy. But you know, I'm not crazy. I'm here. Anyway, <laughs> my, I, so, far, so far, this has worked well for me. And the reason that I am so concerned about it is that I think we have a place where you have to start navigating the, from the patient perspective, and you have to do that at a very young age, and that is access to primary care, good primary care that does all the screening and does all the prevention so that you don't wait until you're, you know, how old, maybe some people even Medicare age, before you find a primary care physician and you get a bunch of tests and you find out things. Anyway, that's me. In my other incarnation, I coach startups. But um, that's enough. Um, you are next, although we've heard Yeah, you've heard my story. Me. So I'm going to go ahead and skip. I'm Lena Spottleson again, and then I'm going to pass it on. Okay. Oh, okay, I was scared it was going to play. Okay. Um, Hi, my name is Taylor Hoffman, and I am 26 years old. I've had type 1 diabetes since I was one and a half, 
And when I was five, I was misdiagnosed with cystic fibrosis, which ended up being celiac disease. So just by changing my diet, I, you know, that was a conversation, even talking about doctors listening to you. They didn't listen to my parents and different symptoms I was having, and they gave them a diagnosis that was uh, life-altering that then ended up being something as simple as just taking gluten out of your diet. And then when I was... 13 years old, I wasn't feeling good, and my hair was falling out, and I just felt really tired, and I got diagnosed with Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, and again, simple, um, just a level of thyroxine every morning for the rest of my life, and then when I was just actually during COVID, so October of 2020, I had been waken, awakening, excuse me, wake, awakening, Getting up. With getting up, getting up in the, <laughs> in the morning with severe um, pain in my joints. And I had complained about it to my doctors, and they thought that it was just stress and making it up similar. You know, you're 25 years old, and you're going and through you're a lot. And you're a woman. And it's, you're a you woman, have, uh, yeah. You can't get me started on how women are mistreated in the healthcare system, but there I've said it. Hey, I got stories all day Damn for right. you. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, and I couldn't figure out what was going on, and I said, I swear I have arthritis. And I had brought that up to my endocrinologist, and again, they thought I was crazy and just making it up. And I called a primary care and got a referral to a rheumatologist, and come to find out, it is rheumatoid arthritis, which also was a sexist conversation when it came to <laughs> treatment. Um, I wanted something as aggressive as possible because I'm 26 and if I have it now I'm gonna have it for the rest of my life so that conversation sex sexism in and of itself was well we don't want to put you on this medication in case you want to have children and so it wasn't even a consideration whether or not that was something that I had wanted for myself and so that's been a conversation even with endocrinology how much of it is hormonal and having male doctors Oh, hormonal. That's, that's the key word for women. Exactly. Hormonal. And so that's even been a battle that I've had personally with trying to explain myself and distancing myself from what it means to be a woman because conversations that I've had with male doctors would not go the same way if it was a male patient. And um, all of these experiences and also navigating the healthcare system when it comes to access to insulin has been its own tornado and whirlwind, whirlwind of chaos. And um, it actually inspired me to seek my, uh, pursue a career in medicine. And so now I am a first year medical student at the University of Arizona, right down the street. And so conversations like today are really important for me. We have a program there where we're teaching people, we're playing acting class, teaching people how to be doctors. And different stories that I've heard so far are things that I've had to explain to my fellow students that our own staff aren't explaining to our students about how you have to talk to patients and giving them options. What do they want for their care? Give them all of the information that you can. And so I just am really grateful to be here. And that is the best thing anyone could do for themselves is study medicine so that you know as much about about it. You know, it's called a practice for a reason. Doctors are still finding out things and the more they the more they practice, the more they find out. So Chris, tell us about you, although I know your story. Tell the audience. <laughs> My name is Chris Walker. Uh, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis 13 years ago, summer of 2009. Um, my life was pretty simple. I was the all-American boy, played hockey, football, baseball, soccer, was traveling the country pursuing my dream to you know, be a professional hockey player and worked my way up into the minor league systems. Um, and one day after a game, that all ended. I got on the bus to go to the next game and collapsed. Uh, I woke up about 8 to 12 hours later in a hospital in the middle of Philadelphia. My team had moved on, um, called, called my parents. Uh, you guys know her as Joan. I know her as Mom. 
Um, call that, my parents. That is the best mom if you're going to be in this type of situation. <laughs> this is not a mom without resources. And, and there's lots of uh, clinicians and, and doctors in here today, and I can tell you I, the first time I've ever seen a doctor confused is when they got on the phone with my mother. Um, with the questions that she was asking and figuring out what was going on, uh, they, they were not going to let me leave there without a diagnosis. And so I did not leave that hospital, hospital until I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Um, I left with a diagnosis that I had no clue what that was. Um, I've now, since I've been diagnosed, I've spent the last 10 years speaking on patient advocacy, right? Uh, patients are not patterns. Clinicians are trained in pattern, and um, that's, that's not what we are. We're, we're people. Uh, because I have Crohn's and colitis and the different medications, I think I tried 12 different medications before they found one that stuck. And I'm not, I'm not a medication. I'm not a pattern. I'm a person. I needed to know, well, how do I handle stomach pain? How do I handle all of the realities of my, my life today, which is a life of Crohn's and colitis? It's not who I am. Who I am as a father, a husband, um, a businessman. I, I, I'm a lot of different things. I'm not Crohn's. I'm not colitis. I am a patient, right? This is just a disease, and I'm not a pattern. So that's, that is so important because there's, there are two things that physicians, and I love physicians. Physicians love, and by the way, I do love physicians. I have been married to two of them. So, <laughs> my, so this love is real. It's not just stage love. Um, and my last husband uh, was a radiologist, and that's what he was trained in, pattern recognition. And his greatest um, triumph was that he could recognize carcinoma in situ in, in a woman uh, from a mammogram. And that was considered a great strength at that time. Now we have found out so much about breast cancer that some carcinoma in situ we don't even treat because things move on and they move on so quickly. So let's see, her next question is, what can our community do better? Blorp, here comes my. Um, you know, I'm not sure what part of the community I should say can do better. Because it really isn't the physician 90% of the time. 90% of the time, the physician is doing his or her best with the allotted 10 or 12 minutes. Um, it's the system. It's the entire system. And what I think we could do better, I think, is educate patients so that they know more about their own bodies earlier. And I'm not sure where we do that because, you know, it's, maybe it's in school, maybe it's not in school, but it's somewhere where we have to train people to be more in touch with their own bodies and recognize their own symptoms as symptoms. Could you have gotten to the doctor earlier if you had known more about your body? Because you were very young. Yeah, I was, I mean, I started that process from the, the time that I started the process to the time I was diagnosed, it was nine months. And I probably, in, in that time, I probably saw about seven different doctors and had a, a bunch of different tests. In fact, uh, the, the gentleman that finally diagnosed me, Dr. Magrino over at Mayo, Mayo Clinic, um, he, he just saw MRI that I had months before. So another doctor had looked at it didn't re recognize it was cancer because what they told me was that's not what they were looking for. Cancer doesn't run in my family. Pattern recognition. Yep. I didn't see mm -hmm. the pattern. 26 years old, uh, cancer doesn't run in my family, no other issues at hand. And that's when I said um, that that doctor, because I was a woman, he said this specifically to my husband, women of her age are self-conscious about their bodies. And... Um, tried to prescribe me antidepressants. So I think, you know, listening to, to your patients when you go in, I think that's probably number one for me, obviously, because of my experience. 
Um, obviously, it wasn't uh, antidepressant. I've, I've actually never been depressed a day in my life. Um, and having another issue because of the cancer, probably a couple of years ago, I went in to figure out what was going on. I was I was getting hormone replacement. They were giving me two estrogen. A doctor actually tried to give me antidepressants again. So just listen to your patient. And, and You know what? I have been on antidepressants for 25 years, and I still don't know if I'm depressed. <laughs> I, some, some, dude, some dude put me on them 25 years ago, and it's very hard to get off them. So yeah. every so often I try, and I give it a go for a while, and everything gets worse. And so I figure, uh, well, I clean up my language. Um, <laughs> the, the, heck, the heck with it. I'll just stay on these. I'm sure they're not working. But they're not killing me either. So, <laughs> but watch out, women. Antidepressants, you know, are the the drug of choice for well, the drug of choice for doctors who have women patients, and the drug of choice for doctors who have men as patients is like Adderall or Ritalin or something to make them calm down in the classroom that isn't. Um, uh, education that's suitable for them. Oh, I have opinions. Um, from my perspective, and I have to give a shout out to my mama in the back row. I won't point to her because she'll, cow she'll cower like, and get mad at me later. Um, anyway, but I think finding your, your crew and people who are going to support you and advocate for you. I know we've mentioned advocacy so many times so far and the the importance of that. We can all say how important it is, but unless you're in that position, you don't realize how much that actually means to you and how much that affects you. And so I guess my piece of advice would be, or how the community could get involved um, more, I guess, um, would be to seek out, especially like uh, in politics now and the way that the world works and that healthcare is a business as well, that going to your state legislators and talking to them about your complaints and um, you'll be surprised how many people agree with you. You might have people who disagree as we live in, we live in a free world. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I think finding those communities and then from there you can determine where the holes are in the system and from there you can enact policy changes or new policies that don't exist already. And um, I think that that's a way that you can impact not only yourself, but also people down the line. And then f over time, you can hone those different policies and make them um, more inclusive to different people. And it's not just whatever disease that you are advocating for, but also people with other chronic conditions or cancer. So that's my input. Chris? Chris? I was holding. That was really good. That was good applause. Um, oh. You don't interrupt applause, especially oh. Oh, true. in my you're house. Right. You you're don't. right. You're right. Um, no, I think something that's important for the community as a whole, and not just patients, but clinicians and, and the, the system as a whole, is not pigeonholing someone to their disease. Um, recently, I walked into a hospital here in, in Phoenix uh, thinking I was having a Crohn's flare. They know how to handle that there. It's, it's a very pretty simple thing. They put you on some, some liquid IVs. They, they take you. They get you a, a CT. Um, it's a pretty simple process. And they were busy. There was no beds available in the ER. And so they put me in a wheelchair, and they put me in a hallway with a bunch of other patients. Well, two hours later, I, I text my wife, who's here in the room. And uh, I also know what it's like to have a very strong-willed wife. Um, she said, if you don't go up to the front and say, hey, something's really wrong, I'm going to come down there with our three kids and do it for you. And anyone who's met my kids knows that that hospital would be in flames. They're crazy. So I, I made my way up there in a wheelchair. And apparently, they had been looking for me because my appendix had burst. And I had been sitting in the waiting room in the hospital just in masses of pain. Just getting gangrene. Yeah. And just and so before you knew it, uh, I'm I'm laying on a hospital gurney. They're rolling me back to surgery, and I'm calling my wife. Hey, I'm going into surgery. Love you. I'll text you when it's over. And again, my wife was as strong-willed as she is. Was what the hell is going on? Um, and so, 
if I would have came in as a patient instead of a Crohn's patient, I think it would have been handled a lot differently. I would have just been a healthy, normal guy without a chronic illness. Uh, I would have been treated a lot differently. Than yeah, they someone. would have tested you for appendicitis. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Instead of just, oh, this is just some kid saying he's got a stomach ache when he's got a chronic illness. Um, so I think looking at patients as a patient and not a disease or a pattern is very, very important. And I'm, I'm kind of beating the same drum here, but I see it as a huge problem. Um, and I've, I've witnessed it and, and felt it firsthand. Well, what I think as a, as a sort of a, a wrap-up for this, what we need really from the system is collaboration. We need doctors to collaborate with one another. We need, um, and I don't know how to make this happen because I, I understand what kind of job being an ER physician is, but we need more uh, collaboration in the emergency room because it, increasingly the emergency room is is a lot of people's primary care so I'd like to give a shout out to Medicare because I have never had better health care than since I got on Medicare I didn't choose a Medicare Advantage plan so I don't have vision and dental and all that but I have first-rate care with no gatekeepers and no co-pays. And if you can afford that, this is the first time things have really gotten treated for me in a timely fashion. And then I'd also like to shout out the new generations of primary care practices because primary care practices are changing very rapidly and there are some really, really good ones. I happen to belong to and love one medical group, but there's also one called Forward and there's one called Oak Street. There are a number of primary care um, practices that have decided that if they go nationwide, they can get better data and they can get you know more collaboration from people in other states and cities who see different things and they can actually give better care because it's really all about the data you know yes you're an individual but you also are a data point <laughs> you know and so we've got to figure out a way to steer between the individual who needs the hands-on help and the, the data point that gives you the knowledge to eliminate at least some things from the many things that can kill us. And then the third shout out goes to the human body because the human body, given half a chance, will repair itself or at least try to repair itself. So for those of you who don't practice any kind of prevention, I would just suggest from 81 years of experience, start. Because if you can stay out of this healthcare system at, the, at this tumultuous time until it evolves into whatever it's going to evolve into, I would do that. Last words, ladies and Chris. The All of Us program, shout out to them too. Oh, I'm going to do that. I did 23 and Me, but I'll do all of us. All right. You can have it, Joan.